India is basically proposing a new law banning cryptocurrencies, finding anyone trading in the country or even holding digital assets. It would criminalize possession, issuance, mining, trading, and transferring. What's what's your take on what's your take on this? God, the fact that governments are chattering about banning it is essentially a silent way of saying that this thing actually has destabilizing value. And the black market is actually almost an interesting, real free market. All right, everyone. Welcome to On The Margin. I'm your co-host, Michael Ippolito. I'm one of the co-founders at BlockWorks, and I am joined, uh, as always, on these Saturday episodes by our senior editor, Mr. Tyler Neville, uh, macro analyst, newsletter extraordinaire. Uh, We're going to be breaking down the top stories in the world of macro and crypto uh, this week. Got a lot of really interesting stuff to talk about this week. We're going to be talking a lot about Morgan Stanley, who's moved into Bitcoin and crypto in more ways than one. Um, We're going to be talking about um, Powell's address in the FOMC meeting earlier this week. Uh, The 10-year, some interesting divergences, Tyler, that you've pointed out in your newsletters this week. Uh, And finally, we're going to be talking about the proposed ban of uh, crypto in India. Um, We're going to do a little history lesson on some governments that have uh, banned gold in the past. So a lot of interesting stuff to get into. But first, before we get into all that, Tyler, how's the week? Uh, It was a rough week. Uh, Personally, my kid, I, I pulled the dumb move and allowed him to watch Ninja Turtles. Oh, and I don't no. think if you've ever seen it before, it could be really full of like nightmarish things. Like they have this one guy called the Krang who's got like, you know, a brain inside a robot body. And so my kid just had nightmares the entire week screaming at 3 a.m., you know, <laughs> and it was, it was just rough. But besides that, everything else, um, you know, market wise and, and uh, work wise was fine. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Everyone's kind of got that one uh, movie they watched when they were a kid that made them sleep with a night on or the light on for a week. I oh, yeah, I yeah. actually remember mine was uh, witches. I don't know if anyone's ever watched Raw Dolls, witches, but that <laughs> scared the living shit out of me when I was a little kid. Um, and I, look, I'm clearly still traumatized to this day. So yeah, this this might date me, but mine was the Leprechaun. <laughs> Do you remember that thing? I'm the Leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably before your time. Jesus. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing along. I, I, I'm laughing at your impression. I, I yeah. feel like I was there based on based on watching you, but okay. um, but alas, no. Um, all right, so let's get into some of the big stories uh, this week. Um, so I'm going to tee you up and just kind of let you you go off on this. But everyone's eyes are kind of on the 10 year uh, yields hit 1.75 this week um, after the Fed kind of had their open markets committee. Um, you talked about this a lot this week in your newsletter. So why don't you kind of just start with what were kind of the key points that people were looking for Powell to say, and then what did he actually say? Yeah. So Powell essentially, uh, stomped out, you know, all the, the inflation, uh, expectations that were on the front end of the yield curve through 2023. He said he's going to keep things on the Fed funds rate basically flat through 2023. And then he hinted at adjusting the SLR requirements, which is just some kind of big uh, regulatory mumbo jumbo where banks were able to buy more treasuries on their balance sheets after the pandemic hit. And uh, that caused essentially the the longer end of the yield curve to flatten. But um, what what happened today, this is Friday, is the Fed said they are no longer uh, extending the SLR uh, exemption. So uh, a lot of that yield curve steepening was priced in by banks selling their treasuries over the past week. Mm-hmm. Um, but what Powell's basically trying to do is thread a needle and the, the big the big 20,000 foot view here is you know there's a monster fiscal plan coming which you have to issue treasuries to fund uh then we have another 3 trillion potentially of infrastructure plan coming down the pipe from Biden which he'll have to issue more treasuries from so the longer end of the yield curve uh has to rise because they have to issue all these treasuries and we saw that really impact all the high valuation long duration assets um, even stocks like tech stocks, I consider long duration assets. Um, so that's sort of what we saw happen on, on the Fed release. The Fed release was kind of a head fake. 
right? Mm. We saw Powell try and stomp out a lot of those things, but he didn't really concentrate on the long end of the yield curve. And then we saw all those, those super high risk assets kind of take, take a fall afterwards. Yeah. So is it fair to say the dynamic basically is that Powell has to watch and watch out for the long end of the yield curve on the most extreme action that he could have taken is you could have seen yield curve control, which would be some peg essentially to some predetermined yield that the Fed wanted to see that would allow them to fund themselves. You call it a yield curve massage, right? So mm -hmm. these other, you know, ways to kind of manage the expectations channel uh, such that outright yield curve control doesn't, they're not talking about that openly. Uh, at least not yet, but it does seem like they've kind of controlled expectations to some degree. Yeah, he's essentially become an expert at, you know, jawboning the yield curve, which is uh, instead of That's outright helpful. doing yield curve control, but like he kind of does this soft dance to try and manipulate, you know, inflation expectations and growth expectations and essentially what we're watching from a 20,000 foot view is he's just trying to control the banking system. And, and what I think he realized over the past 10 years of monetary policy is that by stifling, creating a flatter yield curve, you've actually killed your own banking system. And I think he's trying to essentially create a steeper yield curve. That's not too steep where it doesn't kill economic growth but steep enough where the banks can actually function. Because I think the longer you have this financial repression, uh, you just create more and more leverage in the system. Like everyone re was refinancing their mortgages. He created a mini housing boom by buying all these mortgage backed securities. And, and I think he's trying to slowly walk the market out of that, where it can you know, take time to digest higher yields, the growth rates are there on the economic side of things, but I think it's too late to be honest. I think what we saw from both the corporate bond market and the treasury market is we levered up the system too much and 60, 40 portfolios are no longer going to really work anymore. In my opinion, yeah. you do a great job in your newsletter of pointing out divergences that you're looking at. You've noticed a couple interesting divergences post uh, Powell's address uh, earlier this week. Can you point out what some of those were? Yeah, well, one of the things that really concerned me was the rising rates at the longer end of the curve. And when you historically, bonds have been a hedge against equity weakness. And what we saw after Powell on Thursday was bonds sold off and stocks sold off. But you know what was up? Bitcoin was up. Mm. So volatility was up and Bitcoin was up, which gets my antennas up and says, is Bitcoin transforming into a long volatility asset? I think that's going to be the next month of, of the Bitcoin narrative expanding is this is now a hedge for market weakness. We thought, you know, before it was the inflation hedge. Now is this, you know, if we get, you know, potentially some market weakness here, we could potentially see volatility spike, you know, public assets fall and Bitcoin still outperforming, which I think is a really powerful signal. Really interesting. Because one thing that we talk about a lot is these two kind of competing narratives, right? Um, whereas one, Bitcoin looks kind of like the riskiest of risk assets, right? Which should be and looks sensitive to what's going on in interest rate markets. Uh, on the other hand, there's this other kind of competing narrative where Bitcoin is you know, this high growth kind of asset, it looks like um, it's eating up a lot of market share, just very high growth. Um, so one interesting thing that came out of the Lynn Alden interview that went live earlier this week is we talked about those two sort of competing narratives. And her response, which I'm curious to get your opinion on, was that the primary driver of Bitcoin's price is these four year supply cycles that are anchored around the happening. And in the those kind of bull trends on the way up and bear trends on the way down, Bitcoin can temporarily look correlated to other assets or kind of get pulled in in certain directions. But really, the big anchor for its price movement is these four year um, cycles that it goes through on the supply side. I'm curious, what, what's your what's your input on that? Do you think it's trading really based on kind of in, in line with other risk assets or do you think it really is moving along the, the kind of supply schedule? 
Um, I think she's spot on on that. And one of my you never really want to go against Lynn, I guess. I was kind of setting yeah, you up for, for failure there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the most fascinating, um, I guess, cognitive dissonance pieces of, of financial markets is everyone talks about su- supply and demand secondary a lot of times. Mm. And so I think that's the nuts and bolts. You really have to concentrate on that. And I always bring up here's an interesting dichotomy is that at the same time that Bitcoin is going through this supply constrained bull market, we're seeing actually a giant boom in supply or potential future boom in supply in fiscal in treasury issuance. And everyone always says like, when they talk about, you know, why is the yield curve rising? They never talk about supply and demand of treasuries. You know, mm. they, they never add that up. They just say, oh, growth is doing better and inflation is doing better. And it's like they never actually add up, hey, OK, one point nine trillion in, in, you know, this this Biden plan and then a potential three more trillion coming down the pipe. So so basically five trillion in in treasury supply coming at the same time, you have a tightening supply on the Bitcoin, um, you know, super cycle. So, so it's an interesting dichotomy. It's, it's happening at the exact same time. And, and theoretically you'd see monetary policy come up to buy that extra fiscal treasury supply. Right. So then you, that some of that money would end up flowing into Bitcoin as you make uh, the actual U S dollar supply just skyrocket, which we're kind of seeing. Yeah. So let's um, kind of tie it all together here. So if you look at um, 10 year rates, we're up over 100 bips from kind of its, I think, all time low back in uh, March or April of this year. Um, You know, we touched uh, 1.75%. What are the implications, I guess, moving forward? Do you think that's going to that's a trend that's going to continue? And if so, what are the implications for uh, kind of markets? I think short term, we saw like 80 billion of of treasuries sold at banks. Um, the RSIs on you know treasuries now are very oversold. I think it's like 80 on the RSI scale. But I think we'll have a short term snap back. Oil was skyrocketing too. I think we're actually seeing you know if you look at the oil curve as well you're seeing some backwardation there, which basically means like Saudi can e- increase the supply. So that should take off some inflation pressures in the near term until like, you know, that big, big monetary spigot gets open on the US dollar side. But so I think short term, we're probably in this consolidation phase, but longer term, we are in a cycle from disinflation to inflation. Let's transition a little bit. Why, I want to ask you um, specifically, let's dig into the crypto side of things. And we are seeing these two worlds basically collide with one another because Morgan Stanley will now give access to uh, their clients Bitcoin. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so just to do a quick overview of the story. So Morgan Stanley is giving wealthy clients access to Bitcoin funds. And the way they've defined wealthy clients is clients that have over $2 million held at the bank. Um, So there are three funds that they're giving them exposure to. Two of those are run by Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital. And the third fund is overseen by NYDIG uh, and FS Investments. NYDIG is just a little aside there, but they are really on the come up, man. You know, they were, I mean, I guess active in the market. Uh, They've been active uh, for a while, but they're really just dominating and kind of all over the place right now. So definitely a company to watch. Did a $200 million round hiring headcount left and right. Like I, I can't get over the, and and a lot of those guys are from Goldman Sachs, ironically. So we are seeing that, that world just suck out talent. Yeah. Well, the analysts we know aren't happy at Goldman Sachs. Yeah. That (laughs) That was another great story this week. That was amazing. I mean, we should have we hundred hour work that. weeks. And just so everyone knows, Mike has me working a hundred hour work weeks here too. Yeah, so I know. We, we'll I edit this out. That. Evan, Evan. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, I, you know what I I loved about that Goldman Sachs uh, piece. So for those of you who didn't catch this, uh, Goldman Sachs analysts kind of put together this presentation complaining about their their work hours, and they. 
they basically did an internal poll on things like how likely are you to recommend Goldman Sachs to a friend? How happy are you with your personal life? People said one out of 10 on the how happy are you with <laughs> your personal life. Um, but you know what I, I couldn't get over was the irony of, you know, they're basically working 100 hour weeks making decks and then they made a perfectly formatted deck with the footnotes, you know, about how unhappy yeah. they are making all these decks. <laughs> such, a, such a good point. It's just, oh, I've, I'm on their side, by the way. I think it's, you know, ridiculous. One funny thing that I noticed from that presentation is that they recommended working at Goldman Sachs. They're like, how happy are you with your experience? And they rated it like a two out of 10. And then they were like, how likely are you to refer it to a friend or uh, recommend a friend to work at Goldman Sachs? It was like a five. So people are Dude. happy to recommend a miserable lifestyle to their friends. Yeah, I know. That's what, so funny to me is I think the older I get, the more I realize that people are magnets and you are attracted to other people of a similar mindset. So like, it's just hilarious. The only people that would seek that, I, I had to leave that world because I was like, man, everybody is just so pessimistic and you know, they don't even like their lives and they're doing it for, you know, all this, this money, but you know, some people love it. Who knows? But some people love it. Those yeah. sort of mental things congregate when, when you get into digital assets, it's like a bunch of people who really are creative and original and are worried about growth rather than, you know, overworking. Slide for... deck. Yeah, you know, exactly. Matt, let me cover this. <laughs> Formatting a slide this is the last thing I'll say, and we'll go back to Morgan Stanley here. But yeah, formatting sorry. a slide deck is actually not a useless skill. It gives the appearance, you know, all of the things being equal in a presentation info-wise, if it's formatted well, it's just going to come across better. It's actually a pretty good hard skill to have. But moving back to Morgan Stanley, I think this is a big story, actually, because I think we're in the phase right now of the bull market where people are looking for endorsement. And on the one hand, crypto digital assets overall recognize it's a big paradigm shift, right, in how financial markets are structured and how people access those markets. But I think in the meantime, you need the endorsement of big blue chip institutions like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. And I also think what Morgan Stanley, people don't, you know, typically characterize banks as this, but they're distribution. They are service providers and they are distribution for wealth and capital. And I think they're kind of, it seems like they're testing the waters with these products. But um, presumably, if they go well and they become revenue generators for the bank, then they'll roll out more funds, and that allows more people to access this uh, this asset class. So, overall, I think it's I think it's actually it's a big stamp of approval, um, and it's going to allow more people to participate. Yeah, so, couldn't agree more on that. I think yeah. uh, what's fascinating to me is they, ha they it took them this long to get here, and what's the percentage of Americans that actually own? Bitcoin is like 6% or something. Still pretty low. Yeah. I think it's sub 10%. So with a price at, I don't know, 59,000 and you're seeing these, these guys that usually portend the future, it could be very early, even though superficially you see that price, right? Oh, I, I think so. Definitely. I think it's uh, a guy you recommended that I check out Mark Hart. Um, was he basically talked about the price of Bitcoin being a reflection of adoption rate. Um, so if you look at where we're, where we're at in terms of uh, adoption of Bitcoin on a global scale, it's still really, really early innings. Like if you looked at that kind of classic adoption curve, I don't even think we're in the second bracket yet. We're still in the very early mover bracket. Um, so incredible. Yeah. 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 It'd be incredible to watch. So, so another move of Morgan Stanley's though, you know, they're not just letting clients get access to their funds. They also, there was some chatter that they might actually buy a, a, a Bitcoin exchange. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this is chatter, chatter. So unconfirmed, I do want to give that disclaimer, but it looks like uh, Morgan Stanley is looking pretty seriously into taking a, a large stake in BitHum, which is the largest ex exchange in South Korea. Um, it's an interesting move. I mean, the, the, apparently the amount of the investment could be anywhere from $254 million to $441 million. Um, so pretty, pretty significant investment. Um, I guess the interesting thing to point out about South Korea is it's one of the places in the world where 
crypto adoption is the furthest along. And actually, if you look, there's a really interesting statistic. I'm not sure what month this was. I think it was February. But volume across the uh, largest four crypto exchanges in South Korea, which is Upbit, BitHum, Coin One, and Cobit, reached 14.6 billion, which is actually more than the local stock market, which was 14.5 billion in volume. Incredible. Which is a pretty wild statistic, if you think yeah. about it. Um, and I guess this is something we've been beating, you just really banging on this drum, but this year is going to be the year of m and I think. Um, and you're going to see it crypto to crypto, and you're going to see it financial services to crypto. It would have been cooler, like you and I have talked offline before about potentially someone like Coinbase going on an acquisition spree with the, the valuation that the market is giving them. But this is still a, it's a very big deal. Um, and, you know, part of, it seems like what, what part of the motivation behind uh, this investment is actually there are regulatory changes that are going on in South Korea. And basically those kind of fiat to crypto on ramps, it looks like the government is cracking down and starting to regulate those more. And there's a tax overhaul and an AML, uh, which is anti-money anti laundering um, uh, kind of regulatory procedure going into effect, uh, where basically the government has mandated that exchanges need to partner with a bank and the customers of those exchanges actually need to have an account at the, the bank partner. So I guess from that standpoint, I mean, I'm really, I, this news just came out today. I don't even know if this is how this would work, but that could actually be more accounts as well for Morgan Stanley, right? I don't know how many, um, I don't know how mm. many customers BitHum has, but yeah, I, I think it's just them buying access to innovation in these markets. I don't know. It, it seems yeah. like a no brainer at this point. I just don't think like if they don't buy it now, or if, if these investment banks don't start buying crypto firms, I, I watched an interview the other day with Kyle Bass and uh, the, the CEO of blockchain.com. Yeah. And he, he, the CEO basically said that if he'll be able to compete with JP Morgan in three or four years, and they, they might not even entertain a bid from, from these large investment banks. So they're going to have to buy these investment banks. Will have to buy some of the lower tier assets. I'd imagine. I mean, look at Coinbase, hundred billion dollar valuation, not even public. Yeah, they've lost the ability. They can't buy the tier ones anymore. I don't think. Yeah, it, which is not that I'm calling Bitcoin really, lower tier, but you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just it's really incredible, and it's it's easier for you know, I, I guess blockchain.com to build what J.P. Morgan has than it than it is for J.P. Morgan to build what blockchain.com has and which is just one of the, the most fascinating things. And, and if you see lower and lower growth rates, like I think there's going to be some crazy M and a happening from public markets to, to crypto. I agree. I, I think two, there are two important dynamics when it comes to M and a. So one, when people sign up for a brokerage, which is basically what these exchanges actually are, they never switch. Like never, ever. They're the stickiest products. That's why when there was the proliferation of online brokerages like Charles Schwab and TD Ameritrade kind of back in the day, um, they were willing to pay such high costs for a customer acquisition because they know once you once you stick with the brokerage, you're not you're not changing it. I'm, you know, I, I'm still on the brokerage that that was first open for me, you know, however many years ago, and I don't I don't know what would cause me to switch. Um, so there's, mm -hmm. I think that's a really important dynamic um to, to keep in mind sure. and then the other important dynamic to keep in mind is just it there's a powerful level or incentive at the executive level you don't want to be the next blockbuster right and you don't want to have you don't want to move too early right and be a fool for going out and getting involved in some trend that was a fad and you pay a whole bunch of money and you look like an idiot but you really look like an idiot if you've missed out on the next paradigm shift or wave of innovation. And mm -hmm. I, I think that other type of fear is starting to finally kick in. Um, and and yeah. we might see it, it might manifest itself in a wave of acquisitions. It'd be fun to watch, but. What's interesting to me too is, is uh, they can issue debt. They can, they can do debt fueled M and A on this stuff. And so you, you use potentially, you know, all these unfunded pensions have to hand money to 
uh, say, investment banks issu issuing debt or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they can go out and buy crypto companies. So it's for me, it's almost like this giant arbitrage of this legacy system is is getting money into this new system, and by actually, you know, creating that M and A process is really just handing fiat currency over to the the digital asset ecosystem at the end of the day in because they're they're really better built businesses in in all honesty coinbase is profitable yeah coinbase is profitable that's nuts <laughs> when's the last time you saw a big tech ipo and the company was actually profitable yeah how much money did goldman sachs miss out on with the direct listing of coinbase too instead of going ipo yeah you know are investment banks, do you know if they're concerned about these direct listings? Over, I, I, my understanding is they still make a good bit of money on the fees. They're, they're advisors to the direct IPO or the yeah. direct listing. I don't know the exact economics, but I got to imagine it's less than you know, the whole IPO process the whole and the IPO roadshow thing. and everything. Yeah. But at this point, it's like that was like an 80s process. Why are we still doing that? You know, yeah. It doesn't really make sense. It seems like it seems like there are better ways to, to get it done. And the direct listings, they're becoming more and more popular. I guess it's more friendly to founders and it seems like it's more friendly to VCs really than, than anyone else. Cause there's a, I guess the argument goes, you know, bankers try to price the IPO such that there's a pop um, on the first day of trading, which, which acts as a, a marketing campaign. It's just, what do you assign the value of that marketing campaign? Right, because mm -hmm. if you diluted yourself 300 million or a billion or 10 billion dollars more than you needed to, then you might say, "Okay, that's great. You know, it's aesthetically pleasing. I got my pop, but damn, that was an expensive marketing campaign." <laughs> you know, um, I I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know how to feel about the pop because I don't know how I feel about the pop. How how many like five years out? How many do you even remember which companies had a pop in their IPO? Yeah. I mean, some some of these in the past like six months have been absurd, though. You know, going up like a hundred percent every single, you know, day. Yeah, but it's anyway. pretty crazy. Yeah. All right, last big story to get into here, and then I know you've got some thoughts you want to cover on sixty forty portfolio, and maybe we can close on that. But um, you know, this got some attention, but I don't think it got quite the amount of attention. This isn't really even a news story from this week, but I think it's something that we should just talk about and cover. And I dug into this quite a bit um, because I was just interested, but India is basically proposing a ban on crypto. And I've been hearing about this for a little while now. Something happened back in in January where they actually put this forward, but it seems like you know more details kind of came out about what that would actually entail. So it's it would be the most strict measures against crypto that any com a country has taken so far. So it would be a new law banning cryptocurrencies, finding anyone trading in the country or even holding digital assets. It would criminalize possession, issuance, mining, trading, and transferring. So, you know, the way the logistics of how this would actually work is owners would have six months to liquidate. Um, and I don't know, you know, this would be this would be even more strict than, than China. Um, and they've got a ban on uh, trading and mining. So I don't know. What's, what's your take on, what's your take on this? God, I, I don't know. I, I always think that the fact that governments are chattering about banning it is essentially a silent way of saying that this thing actually has destabilizing value to these, yeah. you know, power control systems. So shorter term bearish, but longer term water finds its level, right? People actually, it's like, uh, I don't know if you talk related about like prohibition in, in, you know, back in the depression years where people are still going to buy and sell the stuff if it, if it holds a lot of value. Right. And the black market is actually almost an interesting, real free market in a lot of senses. So I think that sort of ban will actually give it value in, in some senses and people will, maybe people leave and realize I don't want to be under this financial repression. I'm going to go to a place that actually has, you know, creates this, this free market capitalistic society. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's worries. I think to me, 
regulation and kind of coordinated attacks from government is the last final boss that uh, Bitcoin really has to contend with. And I don't think it's had to contend with that basically at all so far. Um, Yeah, right. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. I don't want your kids listening to this, Tyler. They're going to be up all night. You're going to get no sleep. (laughs) He's the final boss. boss. Yeah. I, you know, I, because I was just curious, I went back and people people don't remember that gold was actually banned in the U.S. at one point. I'm Mm -hmm. cheating because I already asked you this before we recorded, but how long do you imagine that ban went into effect for? I'll pretend I don't know, and I will say five years. <laughs> Thank you. You are generous. It is 40 <laughs> years. 40 years gold That's... was banned in the United States of America. Insane. It's insane. insane. So, okay, let me set the stage. A little history lesson here. In 1933, so U.S. was in the depths of the Great Depression at that time. Back then, we were still on the gold standard. So the U.S. was legally obligated. We had to reserve um, gold, 40% gold for every dollar that we issued, basically. And the problem was, because we were in the Depression, we actually wanted to devalue the currency and print more currency, ease monetary conditions. We could not do that because we did not have the supply of gold to do it. So basically, what the government said was, It is illegal to own gold in the United States. You need to sell it for a fixed price of just over $20. So they buy all these gold from U.S. citizens. They give them like a year to do it. One year later, in 1934, they do the Gold Reserve Act, where they revalue the gold to $35 per ounce. You had some very unhappy people. Um, They essentially used that profit to create a fund uh, to stabilize the dollar, um, and help ease monetary conditions. And that ban of gold continued until we eventually went off the gold standard entirely in the 70s. Insane. Even three years after that. It took three yeah. years more. And then when they finally let the price of gold float, you know, it skyrocketed up, you know, like 5x, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think that these people in digital assets who say, well, yeah, the government could ban it and that would be too bad, you know, but eventually everything would kind of right itself. 40 years, man. 40 years you couldn't own it in the United States. That's a lifetime. That's a whole yeah. investing lifetime. So maybe I think there is more to worry about it than people in this ecosystem give credence to. I, I agree it's definitely a bigger risk, but... Every every game theory possibility that I run through my head is like everyone capital fine leaves to find the right jurisdiction. And there's always gonna be a country that wants to have economic growth. So and this thing is is you have to shut down literally electricity and, and the internet if you want to shut it down. So I'm kind of in that camp. Um but I agree. I mean th- that that history is not really really uh bullish for for gold i mean for bitcoin but who knows at this at this day and age i think the policymakers are out to lunch i mean there's outright frauds in these SPACs coming to market left and right and they haven't done anything they don't have the capacity they don't care yeah so maybe they're probably five years off from really like realizing what bitcoin is one thing i found funny when I started my educational journey about finance, uh, which you've been in it for much longer than I have, I was kind of like, why are people speculating? Why don't people know the answers to these things? You know, people are like, well, the investment, they, the central bankers, they don't know what they're talking about. And even on that Grant Williams episode they did with Paul Singer, founder at, um, what was it? Uh, Elliot. Elliot. You know, they asked him, well, do they not understand or do they not know what's going on? He's like, they, they just don't understand what's going on. That has blown my mind. I guess I just, you know, I'm not inside enough to really know anything, but I just can't believe, I can't believe that that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's bullish or bear. It's, I just, it's hard for me to believe they have no idea what they're doing. Um, well, th- there's know. some, there's some people that call it out. Like that guy Zoltan Posar. I had lunch with him in New York, like, you know, I don't know, a couple months ago, but He's the repo guy, and he's he basically said like, you know, I had to 
basically put together how the financial system works when I worked at the Fed. And I think a lot of people there, he was a younger guy, and a lot of people there don't even know how the whole system works, um, which is really fascinating. It was, it was just cobbled upon each other, right? Like, it's the most complicated thing ever. Whereas, like, this new system is pretty simple, it's pretty easy to use, and I just think it's like it's so much more intuitive about what value is and money is than anything else. It's a little volatile, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. I guess the one major difference between the 1930s and now is that gold was actually linked to the currency. So the reason why they made the U.S. just took a pretty bold step in making gold illegal was because it interfered with the government's ability to fund itself and to get it through an economically difficult time. For the country, obviously, Bitcoin isn't linked to our national currency in any way. I guess the only way I could really see the government getting as involved in Bitcoin as they did in gold back then is if Bitcoin interfered with the government's ability to fund itself. And the way the government funds itself now is by issuing treasuries and treasury auctions, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, and people have started to bring up the link between Bitcoin and gold, right? Because if there is some form of financial repression, bonds essentially become useless and some of that capital probably ends up finding its way into Bitcoin. And I guess I could, I guess, do you think that if the government actually thought that demand for Bitcoin was outstripping or a threat to demand for treasuries, do you think they would take a heavier stance in the space? Yeah, I think eventually. <laughs> I think eventually. But I'm determined to be pessimistic today. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I want negativity. Give it yeah. to me. <laughs> I, I, I do think so, but I don't know how far off that is. I mean, yeah, it's it's tough to it's tough to put a a gauge on that. Yeah, I, I do think that like as an alternative right now, when you see five trillion dollars get printed in the span of like you know, I don't know a year. What was it the Stan Druck and Miller line is like we've printed more money during this recession than all of the five recessions combined. And that is enough for me to basically say, okay, I'm going to put my money over here in Bitcoin um, rather than keep it in, in treasury. Speaking of which, I did want to touch on the 60-40 portfolio, um, which – I hear it's dead. Well, that was, that was one of my big things. Is like, are we watching the bond bubble bursting right now? Because if you have you know, a central bank that is – destined to, to keep the liquidity going in the system and you have inflation expectations actually picking up from a level where bonds are, are priced to perfection, right? What's the point of owning a bond? So like that 40% that forty of the portfolio that you own bond in could just get completely eaten up. It's a, it's a loss. You're taking a loss. And so I'm like, if they do yield curve control, anything they do at this point, will eat up that bond portfolio. And I think the only reason it really stays there is because of compliance. And this is what our fund mandate is. And otherwise, if, if individuals owned bonds at this point, and it wasn't just some these mega corporations or, or pension systems, they would be so far gone and interest rates would be at you know really high levels. So this brings up the Preston Pish you know, theory of is the real interest rate the interest rate you're getting in, in Bitcoin? Because that is really a fascinating concept. Um, because like you're, you're financially repressed here. My bonds are, are essentially toast. I think all that money is going to slowly leak. That 40% will slowly leak one way or another into the digital asset ecosystem. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree. I... Um... I had a buddy recently who told me he, he came into some money and he was we were kind of jokingly talking about what he should do with it. And the first joke that came out of his mouth is, yeah, I'm just going to put it in treasuries, watch my money disappear. And it's kind of funny on two different levels, because on the one hand, we're talking about treasuries. Like, wh wh what is the, you know, where that's even a, a joke? And two, it's just it's kind of finding its way into, you know, more people are aware of the problems now, um, yeah. I think, than ever before. Is it's a joke. It's like, why would I ever put my money in, you know, um, 
in the bond market. It's just you're just going to lose it, basically. Yeah. So, and I think the big cue of that is when do baby boomers sell these these portfolios, these risk assets? When we just saw the long bond fall like I don't know twenty five percent with that little backup in yields. So, or maybe it's twenty percent. It depends on the duration. But what point do do baby boomers look at their portfolios and their like you know retirement IRA or and they say, oh my god, I'm losing money. Like what? I'm losing money on my bonds and and wait, I'm losing money on my stocks too. Like I get you can hedge in like inflation stuff. Like you know, uranium is probably going to be a banger of a trade or or oil or whatever. But everyone always says that. How many people are going to be like, yeah, you know, I'm going to go put my money in uranium? I just, people are going to do that. I I don't know. I know. I know they're not. That too. What am I going to go put my money in commodities right now? I. Yeah, but what we're really talking about is it's an over diversification problem is that yeah. this whole fee grab for a generation was like, oh, just put your money in a diversified portfolio and it's all going to grow. And then, then we're going to jimmy the system to a point where it can't work anymore. And like now you actually have to take concentrated bets to avoid getting eaten up. And I think we're at that point now where you need inflationary assets or long volatility assets at this point in the cycle. It's funny. So let's say you approached this problem from the perspective of being a millennial or a boomer that's mm-hmm. about to retire. And I think it's actually where asset prices are is really undesirable for both of those groups. Because on the one hand, every asset price, right, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, seems impossibly high, right? And it seems really difficult over the long run. Like, you know, how, how am I ever going to actually seriously grow my wealth where assets being priced where they are. On the other hand, if you are a baby boomer and you are about to retire, the absolute worst thing that can happen is a major dip in your portfolio because you have no time to recover. So a millennial who's just going out there and kind of accumulating wealth for the first time, you got you got time, right? You can weather huge bouts of volatility. If you are a baby boomer, you don't really have that option. You know, if there is some big, you know, 30 or 50% drawdown in the market, that is going to impact your retirement in a very permanent way. So it's kind of like the system's not working super well for, for anyone, actually. Um, yeah. And you're I'm really seeing keeping it. on my thread of negativity today. Are you impressed <laughs> with my consistency? <laughs> We're going to keep you in the, the bull market, you know, growth mindset. We'll get you All right. There. Next yeah. weekend, I'm uh, all positivity, all positivity. <laughs> I don't believe but in I- moderation. I'm either all negative, all positive, you know? People I agree. You got to have, you got to be a little self-aware here. And I, I don't, I really don't get what you do as a boomer. If you see that the way boomers react is they see their prices fall 20% and then they're like, Oh my God, should I sell? Like, cause they hold all the majority of those assets. The question is like, who the hell is going to buy all those? I think the only logical next step is the fed does yield curve control and the fed starts actually buying assets like the bank of Japan did. The Bank of Japan owns like 60% of their market at this point in real estate. They, they bought REITs and ETFs to keep this like post-truth, keep the money in the hands of the powerful, right? And now that Bitcoin exists and it's gaining steam, I think when you see that happen, it's just that Bitcoin is going to skyrocket because that's them saying, okay, there's no way to pay out these pensions. There's, we got to make sure that these old people have money for retirement. And then you see that 1970s old school inflation come back. You showed me a really interesting chart. Maybe we can actually talk about that for a little bit now, which is the spread between the five year and the 30 year break even. Now you understand this chart way better than I do. So why don't you break it down? What is this chart showing and why is it interesting to you? Yeah, this chart is really kind of interesting because it shows in the next five years, it's the market rate of what the market's pricing and inflation at versus the market rate of pricing and inflation in the 30 years. And what you see is the ratio of those two things is at an all time extreme where we've bid up inflation for the next five years, basically because of fiscal policy, monetary policy, uh, supply chain problems like all these like real 
bona fide inflationary issues are happening within the next five years. But then if you look out 30 years, those inflation expectations are not really as present, which, which tells me there's a giant disinflationary, deflationary overhang because of demographics. Really what it is is baby boomers will have to sell all these things or pass them down. All these assets will have to change hands and a lot of them will probably get sold, right? I, I think in, in then our generation and you know the Gen Zers are in this massive amount of debt um, from student loans and, and credit card debt and all sorts of stuff. So I think that's what this chart is telling you is Here's in five years, the government's going to try and paper over this immensely, but who knows? 30 years, we'll probably have a, a deflationary bust. That's what the market's saying right now here, but uh, I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I guess we'll see. All right. I think people have heard enough of us talking for this week, but we got to hit them with yes. predictions before we leave. So Tyler, what's your prediction for the week? I think Bitcoin is going to shoot to a hundred thousand within the next three months. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a headline prediction right there. Um, what's, what's driving that thought? I think massive, uh, money is now coming in like the Morgan Stanley type type, uh, news and the holders are getting more confident. So the supply constraints are really going to cause problems on the demand side. Like you're going to have to chase and not only that, but the retail person is also nowhere to be found. Like my, I call it the mother-in-law indicator and I hope she's not listening to this, but like my, <laughs> my mother-in-law yeah, indicator is when she starts, mother-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> she starts asking me whether or not to invest in it. That's when I'm like, uh Oh, no, I haven't had many friends like, I've been kind of more active on social media, LinkedIn and, and Twitter, and I still don't have friends being like, Hey, uh, it looks like, it looks like you're in digital assets now. Uh, how the heck do I get into this thing? So compared to 2017, where everyone was coming out of the woodwork and being like, Hey, tell me about Ethereum," And you know, it's, it's really a fascinating dichotomy because that's really when bull markets end is when you see that retail come in to really have the super spike. We haven't seen that. I just got added to a group chat of friends from college who are all talking about altcoins. And the wow. irony is I wish I'd listened to these guys. Every, every little thing they're talking about is shooting to the moon. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, nah, I'm not going to do any of that. Then joke is on me. Joke is on me. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, longer term, I think we're all, we're all going to be okay. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, I think everything's going to be fine. Um, so my prediction for this week is I think that you will see some major crackdown happening um, within crypto within the next six months. And I actually think it will come from countries with strict capital controls. I do not think that it will be from the United States. If you look at the countries with some of the strictest enforcement on crypto right now, it is um, India and China right? Uh, very worried about uh, capital outflows. So I think that that's where you will see, you know, other kind of similar countries, um, there will be enforcement actions. And I think it will happen at the exchange level. So I'm not really going up making bold predictions here. But I do think and, and one trend that started to happen recently is VCs funding exchanges overseas, right? There've been big rounds raised in kind of the you know, uh, large Mexican exchanges or South African exchanges. Um, and I think that that will be a, a vector of attack for countries that are uh, concerned about capital outflows, basically. Well, that pits us against each other. One of us. Is <laughs> I right know. Now. Sorry. I know. We got to put some money on it. All right. All right. We will. Um, what are your plans for this weekend? Uh, watching the games. One of my buddies uh, uh, lives 15 minutes away. Uh, we both played basketball in college. I mean, I yeah. clapped. He actually played. Um, so we're gonna <laughs> we're, we're gonna watch the games all day. And Shots fired. Have, what have you, some how, great... <laughs> how confident are you feeling in your Blockworks March Madness bracket? Oh, d 
dude, I'm, I haven't watched a game. I have two kids under three years old. I'm like the biggest loser on the planet. This is like a vacation for me being able to watch games uh, for a couple hours. So I haven't watched any games this season. Yeah. I, every time the subject of March Madness comes up, I consistently am reminded of exactly how little I know about sports. <laughs> uh, it, is a, it is a stark reminder. I filled mine in this year, you know, with five minutes to go. And I was basically just, yeah, I actually looked up a, a little AI bracket. Um, and I, you're going to use win. that as inspiration, you know, let's see. Yeah. yeah. Who, who do you, who do you have winning this year? God, I, I think I picked like Villanova or something. I, I was I'm a big old. Jay Wright guy. I like Jay Wright. But uh, All right, cool. anyway, I don't even think you know who that guy is. No, I don't. But I nodded. <laughs> I nodded. <laughs> you know, I would so. have had people fooled if you didn't just uh, call me out there. But yeah, I was um, yeah. nodding along. Well, I myself am. Uh, so I just moved into new apartment. I've got mm. a little outdoor space, rare for New York. So big Home Depot weekend oh, wow. for me. Very exciting. I'm going to get a power washer. Are you going to hit Olive Garden afterwards? So uh... I just might, Tyler. I just might get wild and crazy <laughs> nice. at Olive Garden. Have you ever used a power washer? It's actually... Uh, therapeutic? It is therapeutic. It is therapeutic. <laughs> You're like, I've never seen this thing so clean before in yeah. my entire... And I don't feel embarrassed to say I'm actually looking forward to power washing. My my outdoor area. Um, can can we all get a picture of that, please? Um, we'll talk about see it the offline. Before and after. Yeah, we'll talk we'll talk about it offline. It's not yeah. even that bad. It's not it's not that bad. I just want it to be nice, you know, nice. Yeah. I feel well, like this is the this is the age where I'm you know I'm excited about socks on Christmas and I'm bragging about power washing an outdoor oh, area. Yeah. So. Next thing you'll know, you'll have kids and uh, your fashion sense just goes completely out the door. I'm way ahead of the curve on that, my man. <laughs> way ahead of the curve. You know, people started talking about, you know, this norm core, you know, which is the fashionable, it's like dressing in a dorky kind of way. And then there's dad core. Oh, I've yeah. been on the dad core thing. I practically invented that trend. I feel like I should be credited with that trend. I've had I my. I feel like you wear like giant cargo shorts. I do not want, thankfully, I got rid of the cargo shorts, but I did, you know, I've got- New balances? These, the new balances. <laughs> I've, got, <laughs> I've got these, you know, really thick bottomed new balances because, oh, yeah. you know They're why? They're great for your arches. They're great for They're your great arches. They're great for your arches. That's exactly right. And support <laughs> on your back. You Dude, I'm, I'm 10 years older than you too. Can't put, <laughs> can't put a price on that kind of comfort and support. I don't know. I don't know what you want from me. Um, and we haven't gotten paid from New Balance, by the way, for for the. For we this have show. not. No, we have not. But we should be. This is yeah. This yeah. New Balance. You're you're welcome. Um, all right, guys. So just if you've made it this far, you know you're listening to On the Margin. On the Margin is a two part show. We do an interview earlier in the week, and then every. Uh, Saturday, Tyler and I do a recap of the entire week where we talk about big stories in kind of crypto and macro. If you are listening to us on Apple or Spotify, please make sure to give us a rating and a review. Um, if you're on Apple, definitely hit subscribe. And if you're watching us on YouTube, do all the things. Give us the like, give us the comment. Tell us what we should, we should be talking about next week. Give us your feedback. We want to know. Until then, Tyler, this has been fun, my man. And we will yes, we'll see you all next week. See you guys.